Okay. All right, so after lunch, the <laughs> wind down, I'm just going to talk about the um, Cheetah Met Population Project that um, I'm involved in South Africa and, um, you know, how we're doing sort of some of the cheetah conservation um, in South Africa. Uh, this presentation is largely um, put together by Vincent van der Merwe, who's the Meta Population Manager in South Africa. Um, so we've been working on the India project together as well, and um, he's one of the co-authors on that paper, that, that survey that we did um, looking at mortality, because, I mean, he's the guy that's basically moving the animals around in South Africa from one reserve to the other. Um, <clears throat> so maybe I'll just start by saying, uh, you know, in South Africa, it's a little bit different to Namibia and South Africa different. Uh, Namibia, they have a, a, a different conservation style. They are... Uh, captive breeding of cheetahs in Namibia is illegal. Um, ownership of wildlife is more of an issue than in South Africa, where we have fairly strong ownership, um, private ownership of, of wild species in South Africa. Um, and I suppose that there are advantages and disadvantages of, of both of those. Certainly in terms of the captive breeding of cheetahs in South Africa, it's, I mean, it's, it's obviously been quite a difficult thing um, to to, with only a few institutions that have managed to do it very, very well. Um, Anne van Dijk at the, uh, at, um, you know, near, near Pretoria, uh, you know, she started off with, with um, some of the, the captive breeding methods in cheetahs and did very, very well. And Kango has done very, very well in terms of breeding. But now there are a whole lot of uh, other breeders in South Africa that are actually uh, breeding cheetahs and exporting them, you know, all around the world. Um, at one stage, that was... Uh, you know, potential problem because because breeding is sometimes so difficult because many people don't understand the the process. The the temptation to try and get cubs from the wild uh, and pass them off as hand you know a, a captive bred um, is very high. But um, a few years back, we instituted this kind of genetic uh, fingerprinting of of cheetahs. So if you wanted to export a cheetah now. Um, from South Africa, uh, you have to basically prove parentage. So you're going to have to take a blood sample from it. You're going to have to have blood um, samples from the, the parents uh, already in the database, genetic database. And so um, it's it's becoming it, and that, that just just doing that, just just making sure that we have um, a, a genetic profile of uh, captive cheetahs has made a huge difference in South Africa, forcing captive breeders to go down that route. It kind of already separated those that wanted to kind of do it um, without, do, you know, going through the proper processes and applying for all the, the proper permits to, to, you know, it made it very difficult for them to do it. Um, and it certainly has stopped any of the uh, movement from wild cheetahs into captivity uh, almost completely. Um, so we're pretty confident, in, and I'm always of the opinion that when you're doing conservation, you don't exclude one particular part of, of the, you know, don't say, well, zoos have no role to play, or you say captive breeders don't have any role to play. You, you try and maximize everything, you know. And at the moment, what is happening really with, with doing that, by doing that, I mean, obviously people are selling these cheetahs and making some profit out of it. But what you're making sure is that the international market, there are plenty of cheetahs available uh, from South Africa. Um, and that there's no temptation to take them from, from the actual wild. And there are a lot of people in South Africa also now do rewilding programs, and I don't, you know, that, that absolutely go for that as well, you know. Um, there certainly are reserves where uh, cheetahs that are bred in captivity and eventually can be released into the wild, especially reserves that don't have lions uh, or leopards or competing carnivores. They, they certainly learn to hunt very quickly. I think there are some people that seem to make it, sound like it's, you know, this, you have to teach them how to hunt and, it's, you know, demonstrate hunting to them. They're absolutely not. They really have the instinct, even if they've been born in captivity, and will start hunting very, very quickly, you know, without the need for anything major. But one of the biggest problems with captive cats is that they are habituated to people, um, and so they have to go into a fenced reserve. They can't go into open areas where they are going to wander into a village or something like that um, and associate people with feeding. And then the other thing is that they, they tend to be a little bit naive when it comes to interactions with lions, hyenas, leopards, um, and that can get them into you know, fairly big trouble. But we've also had cheetahs in uh, South Africa that were captive bred, who've gone into reserves and managed to figure out how to coexist with lions and, and how to work around them um, you know, very easily. So that has worked as well. 
And um, so this really is a very successful project in South Africa. Uh, cheetah populations worldwide are still unfortunately in decline. Um, this, however, is the only population really that is uh, actually growing. Okay. Um, and so maybe to, to just tell you a little bit about the success of this. All right, so in terms of the historic range, um, cheetahs occurred in most of Africa, except sort of the real uh, forested areas um, of, of Eastern Africa, oh, sorry, Western Africa. Um, but uh, the rest of Africa was previously um, occupied by them all the way into the uh, Middle East and then across into, into India um, <clears throat> several thousand years ago. Now, currently, we probably less than 9% of the original range in which they currently still occur. Um, and, I mean, this, this was the pre original range, you know, in terms of high density versus uh, very low or lower, lower density. Um, and mainly, the biggest problem that we have with them is the habitat loss uh, due to crop farming and urbanization. And then the, the issue with the interaction of uh, them with uh, livestock owners. Um, and it and it really, you know, is um, a major problem even in Namibia, which traditionally has been the big sort of cheetah stronghold. Uh, that population mostly, ex you know, exists on commercial farmland and um, very large farms where it's almost impossible to do any sort of policing. And most of those cats are at risk of getting shot by those farmers. They don't really care very much at all, you know. And they're going to shoot a cheetah. Nobody's going to know about it. They'll just bury it. You know, you'll never, you, 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 nobody's going to find out. Um, so it, it still is a massive problem in terms of the interaction. What um, uh, Vincent has really done very nicely is to show the relationship between cheetah conservation or cheetah survival, uh, persistence in the environment and, the, the, and agriculture. And in, in you know, looking at the different populations of cheetahs around the world and then looking at um, how long farming has persisted in that area. And obviously in India and the Asian area, Middle East, farming I mean, goes back 14,000 years. Um, whereas in Southern Africa, it's only been around for um, a couple of thousand years. And looking at you know, the, the differences in terms of the cheetah populations, the stability of the cheetah populations, it's, it's quite interesting to have a look at that. I think he's pretty much doing this as part of his PhD at the moment, um, his PhD study. So if we just look at the Middle East um, in terms of human population growth um, in these four different areas, um, this is uh, Middle East and India and North Africa, these are areas obviously where cheetahs occur, West Africa, East Africa and Southern Africa, I mean the Middle East and India, uh, massive population um, growth and obviously they've been involved in agriculture for a, a lot longer. Um, so just focusing on Asian and North African, um, yeah, you can see the dates at which uh, cheetahs become sort of extinct, uh, 1948, 1947, 1948 in India, um, and then in the 60s and 70s around Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, and then in North Africa and certain, you know, more recently, um, and in Egypt, 2014. Currently, the only population of Asiatic cheetahs, this, this uh, cheetah over here down the bottom, you can see it's slightly more, um, a longer coat, especially on the belly and on the back of the neck. Um, with, uh, that, that's probably the most distinguishing feature. Um, the only cheetahs that exist anymore, there are probably about 12 of them, um, Asiatic cheetahs in Iran, uh, wild cheetahs in Iran. And I think they've only got two of those 12, only two are females. You know, so that population is pretty much... Uh, doomed. I mean, I, I don't think that there's any, there's much chance of us um, resurrecting that population, and it's highly inbred. If you, even if you compare it to the Southern African cheetah in terms of uh, genetic diversity, uh, I mean, not the cheetah is not, uh, a, you know, it doesn't have a massive genetic diversity to start off with, um, but these ones in in Asia are um, are even worse off. So I just wanted, yeah. Um, I just want to see this graph over here. Oh, I mean, most of the Asiatic cheetah mortalities in the past 15 years, about 40 animals have died, most of them due to um, anthropogenic change or anthropogenic causes, being shot by people, poached, uh, snared, um, hit by cars, various things versus natural causes, you know, which are very, very low. So, and that's not likely to change anytime soon. 
This is now what a Asia, I mean, not a, the, the cheetahs in Iran look like. Um, they, for me, resemble more the North African or the West, you know, North African kind of um, subspecies. Um, very sort of thin looking, a uh, uh, lot less hair around the actual uh, neck um, and, and underbelly, um, and a lot paler in color. Um, so, this is a camera trap photo taken at a waterhole. Then um, another inter sort of interaction with a with a camel over here. I think that's gonna, at night, with two two uh, cheetahs in Iran. <laughs> yeah, you just see the eyes. <laughs> now these camels can actually sort of just keep them completely away from the actual water hole and the ability to be able to get water sometimes. So it's you know it's it's this kind of constant um, issue that is going on. Um, but more often, many people in the area have automatic weapons, and you know, cheetahs. When they cheetahs look, they even look at their livestock. They um, really don't have the same sentiments of, of you know, uh, conserving them. Um, West Africa. I mean, if you look at their population compared to East Africa and Southern Africa, the human population growth. I mean, it's quite massive. Um, uh, plant domestication and. Uh, Full suite of Middle Eastern domestic animals arrived, you know, 4,000 years ago. So that area has already been fairly well established in terms of farming and so on. And, and um, you know, we also have major um, population growth in that area. Okay, this is the sort of population density, people per square kilometer across Africa. And um, you can see that whole area of uh, West Africa quite densely populated, one of the most densely populated areas in Africa. Um, this is the distribution of the current West African cheetah, that's Western North Africa. Um, and uh, as you can see, that sort of pale uh, coat with a very short hair, sort of small head. Um, and there's probably less than 200, 250 individuals left. Uh, supposedly be 191 cheetahs in uh, southern Algeria, in that area of southern Algeria. I think that's highly unlikely that we have anything close to that number. It's probably quite a lot less now. Um, so those populations are tiny, and they're really not, um, you know, substantial enough to, you know, very unstable areas. So um, not necessarily a, a good place to reintroduce or uh, to get um, additional animals from. Um, the East African uh, cheetahs are very, very similar. I mean, look, they, I mean, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a, a cheetah from East Africa and Southern Africa. They, they're almost identical. These are the cheetahs that we probably will have seen on uh, National Geographic and all these programs. I mean, uh, we always sort of say to people that, you know, the cheetah, we always think of them as these plains hunting grassland species. Um, I'll show you a, a few of the areas in South Africa where, where we have cheetahs, and it's very, very different. But this is the place I always say that people, that's where we film them. That's where they are visible to the public. That's where... You, you get the best film footage from them, but that's certainly not the only environment that they, are, they, they live in. And um, populations there, I mean, going up into Ethiopia and then to Maliland, um, it's actually a potentially a continuous range. There isn't no, 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 no real geographical barrier over there, and yet they split them, you know, if you're really technical, split them up into subspecies, um, which I'll show you in, in a moment. But this number, um, the biggest really... Uh, Populations here are in Kenya and Tanzania, um, and then with smaller pockets um, elsewhere. Right, and then in southern Africa, um, our really big populations in, in Namibia, um, probably now, that has been surpassed by uh, Botswana, where we still have fairly large tracts of, of land where these animals still exist. Um, the northern part, just the northern edge along the Limpopo River in South Africa, where we really, I mean, they, that 1,200, I think, is nowhere near uh, actually the, the true amount. We hardly ever see cheetahs in that area. Uh, but they will be, that will be completely, you know, in non-protected areas and on um, uh, commercial farmland. And they will be crossing over the Limpopo River from between uh, Botswana and South Africa. And then up in Zimbabwe, there's probably less than 100 cheetahs left in the whole of Zimbabwe uh, at this stage. So that, that number of 200 is, is an uh, uh, overestimation. 
in the Kruger National Park, we still have in South Africa um, a very stable population, around 400 um, cheetahs, probably the biggest um, single cheetah population anywhere um, you know, in the world, in a protected area. And then um, the Kalekhari National Park, which is on the border of, of uh, Namibia, where we also have a few, uh, uh, just over 100 cheetahs. Um, and then you'll see the scattered very tiny little pockets all over South Africa, but that's actually the population that's doing the best at the moment, which we're going to talk about. Um, okay, I'm going to just skip that one. All right, so this just gives you a little um, idea of, of what happened in South Africa. I mean, actually, we, we almost decimate, decimated our own cheetah population um, with only those two protected areas, the, the uh, um, Kruger National Park on this side, Kalakari National Park on that side over there, um, and pretty much, you know, in the 1900s, uh, late 1800s, the cheetahs were basically shot out or uh, completely um, decimated. Most of our reintroductions then came um, in 1960s and 70s from, from um, Namibia. So most of the Southern African cheetahs now that are present in South Africa come from Namibia. Um, initial introductions, reintroductions in South Africa were very unsuccessful, I think, mainly because they, they really quite, you know, didn't, most of them were hard releases into areas that, they, you know, there wasn't suitable prey available and um, the animals were not monitored. So, you know, our population in terms of uh, the number of metapopulation reserves at that stage for most of the, uh, until the, the democracy in, in 1994, um, you know, there, there were really very few reserves that were accommodating uh, cheetahs. Since then, um, things changed quite a lot, and now, you know, we have almost you know, 60 um, reserves that, uh, you know, have got cheetahs and are part of the metapopulation project. And part of this was due to some changes in the law. So the Game Theft Act was largely responsible for the major change in land use um, from livestock production over into wildlife um, ranching in South Africa, people could gain um, an income from wildlife in many different forms by breeding game um, and selling them, uh, part of the hunting industry, both for trophy hunting as well as for um, for game meat and, and local hunting. Um, but more importantly, you know, the Act gave private landowners ownership of wildlife under the conditions um, of adequate fencing. So private land, previously, you know, any game that occurred on your farmland actually belonged to the state in some way. And so you, you know, you could utilize it, but it was never, you could never actually commercialize it. And so the, I guess there are advantages and disadvantages of, of private land or of private um, wildlife ownership. Um, if you give an animal a value, it can have a lot of negative effects um, in terms of those animals being bred. And in South Africa, we've had our fair share of all kinds of things being bred color variants of different uh, antelope species being bred and um, you know sold uh, for a fortune. That became a massive pyramid scheme which collapsed in about 2016. But there's still people that are selling buffalo for enormous amounts of money, wild buffalo uh, that have been bred specifically for the size of their horns, you know, whatever, and trophy hunting. It's become a, a little bit less popular now um, because the worldwide we're getting a lot of pressure in terms of, tro you know, a lot of people being very anti-trophy hunting. Hunting in general is not that popular. Um, but there still obviously is demand uh, in various different countries. You know, we still get a lot of visitors from the US, from Russia, and so on, who are still very interested in hunting and hunting all of the species that they can possibly hunt, even you know, have people wanting to hunt black-footed cats. And I get, you know, I don't know what, what on earth do you want to do you know, with a black-footed cat, hunting, you know, shooting an animal that size. I don't I really have no idea why you do that, but anyway. Um, what we saw really is just that people could gain quite a lot of um, money. I, now, these, most of these, these reserves that we're talking about that are accommodating cheetahs now are not hunting reserves. They are there. Tourism is a big thing. Um, so they're providing, do, doing um, safaris, getting overseas visitors, mostly uh, for photographic safaris, for just the experience of seeing these animals. So very, little, very few of them actually, um, actually have got you know, a, a lot of hunting taking place. But yeah, for example, I mean, in South Africa, you could get 26,000 rand for a cow uh, or a bull, um, a domestic cow, whereas, you, you know, at one stage we had this bull, this particular bull sold for $2 million. 
Um, now that's insane uh, because I'm not sure how you actually, that, that animal's not worth that amount of money. I mean, in any form, even as a trophy, nobody's going to pay $2 million to hunt that animal. It supposedly would sire a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, buffalo with equally big horns and that, you know, potentially could create uh, an income. But it's, as I said, it's a little bit of a collector's story. People, you know, um, would offer that amount of money, and once you pay that amount of money, that animal's worth that amount of money until it dies in translocation or due, due to a. So you can imagine what the vet, veterinarians who have to immobilize that animal to treat a wound or do something with it, you know, um, they have to be horribly insured in order to make sure that they don't have a problem if that animal dies. And the olive bull, so, okay, I don't know what, how current these prices are at the moment, but I mean, you can get, you know, for a fairly large bull, two, 2,000, 2,500 US dollars um, for an animal like that. In Palo, we're going for sort of $240 at one stage. I mean, in prior to 2016, we, we, were, we had in Palo that, you know, we were repairing fractures, you know, uh, bone fractures and stuff like that. Never heard of. Previously, if a Palo fractured a bone, you would just pass it on as meat you know, um, or feed it to a lion or something like that. Now they were coming into the veterinary hospital and uh, we suddenly had to work out, okay, now we're we going to f put a bone and plate and, and pins and all kinds of things into these very high valuable, um, you know, animals that were previously had no value at all or very little value. Um, so in South Africa, I mean, originally, okay, so in the late 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, the only animals really that were coming into South Africa were coming from across the border from Mozambique into those protected areas um, across the, the border from Botswana or Namibia. Um, but there were very few cheetahs anywhere else in South Africa. And there were some established populations along that border on commercial farmland. Um, many of those animals, uh, 157 cheetahs, were removed from the ranch land. Again, that's where the, um, you know, they were causing problem with livestock. And initially, um, they provided a certain source of animals to reintroduce into other reserves in South Africa because the farmers certainly didn't want them on their uh, property. Um, but there were places then to eventually release them into South Africa, into reserves in South Africa. So this is kind of what we look at the moment. There are different sort of clusters in the Eastern Cape, Northern KwaZulu Natal, the Northwest uh, Limpopo Province, in the Northern Cape, and then even some in the in the in the Western Cape. Um, at this stage, this is like 41 reserves, I think, but we're already up to about 60 or so at the moment. But what if, one of the problems is that we're running out of space, uh, you know, in, in, the, in terms of new, um, new farms and, and new reserves be, becoming available, you know, that will accommodate uh, cheetahs. Um, so it, it, we've done very, very well, but now we, we're getting to the point where we're producing quite a lot of cheetahs off that reserve, off, off those reserves. So here you can just see um, what happened when, in 2011 when we started the metapopulation project. Okay, there was a little bit of a, a dip in, in, in the total number of animals in 2012, but then really it's, it's continued to climb um, quite substantially in 2018, and this is up to, only up to 2018. And then after that we actually see even a further exponential rise. The current growth rate of that population in those small reserves is about 8.8% per year, which basically comes to about 50 or so uh, cheetahs that are surplus to requirement. And w one of the big sad things is that if we, if we don't have new space available to put these animals into, then we're going to have to start some sort of contraceptive program um, to reduce because they cannot be allowed to just continue to, to breed in some of these small reserves because they will decimate the, the local antelope population. Already in Swalu, I mean, at the moment, this last year, that we've taken 20 cheetahs off um, the, this reserve. It's a, a, the, probably South Africa's largest privately owned reserve um, because the springbok population absolutely be decimated. And, and part of uh, the reason for that is a very nice growing cheetah population. Um, so it can't be allowed to really continue. You've got to control and manage the population because we're in such a, a situation where they're not free roaming, where we've got them in fenced reserves. And... Um, the population to grow. So now we could start pumping a whole bunch of these cheetahs back into different areas in Africa. But the problem there is that many of those places are very unstable. They have a high degree of poaching. Uh, we can't guarantee the safety of those animals. And it really, in many cases, would be basically sending them off to, you know, with a death sentence. So there's a, a big demand to look at places where the control and um, 
uh, care of these animals would be uh, at a much greater level, and that's why we're looking now even further afield right back uh, to India where they occurred, be you know, or at least where the species occurred before. All right, that just shows that last curve over here. The other thing that we found is as soon as you start removing ex the, the surplus animals, I mean, the pop as, as you know, with many sort of populations, you stimulate growth in the, uh, in the, the, the baseline population because you, you're creating space for these animals to expand. And we've certainly seen sort of um, cheetahs you know, that previously would have raised two or three cubs to adulthood. Now we've seen cheetah females that are raising five to six cubs all the way up to adulthood. You know, so that expands the population at a very, very rapid rate. And they are a species that potentially can uh, you know, uh, achieve a very high uh, growth rate population growth rate, if given the right conditions. So this just shows you the um, problem that we have around the world, th though. Every single one of these, these was based on the 1975 uh, census compared to the IUCN's 2016 data. And you can see every single population that is mentioned over there uh, is on the decline. Some of them are completely in Congo. They're gone. Uh, Mauritania, they're gone. Uh, Cameroon, they're all gone. Um, you know, so populations, they're all in decline. The same is true for many uh, other populations. Um, Kenya is down from 2,000 to 650, same in, you know, more, you know, in Tanzania. Um, the only population really here that is growing now is in South Africa, where we've gone from 500 uh, cheetahs to 1,200 um, in that time period. And I'm pretty sure that South Africa is going to end up with the probably the largest population because both Botswana and Namibia, the strongholds of, of cheetah conservation, um, those populations are definitely still in decline. The other, other one is Malawi, where we've recently done a, another, re, a few years ago, we did an, uh, a reintroduction um, into reserves in Malawi, and they've also got proper fenced reserves, um, and that population is really doing very, very well at the moment. I mean, some been some articles about, um, you know, vultures coming back in because of a reintroduction of the predator you know, is into those reserves, which are obviously uh, having an effect on, on prey and making, you know, carcasses available for other th animals like, uh, like vultures. All right, so <laughs> it has its advantages and disadvantages in South Africa. We have a very much a fortress uh, approach. So massive fence, fences, most of these reserves are designed to, to actually, I mean, they could be anything from just keeping, you know, game species in to predator-proof fencing, where actually even a leopard would not be able to cross that, that sort of boundary. Um, and whilst they offer a very high level of protection, I mean, there also are uh, quite a number of um, negative effects, too, in terms of the ability of animals to migrate across those um, fences. Um, there also is a change in the utilization of those fences. We see wild dogs actually utilizing the fences uh, in order to catch their prey. They chase the actual animals directly into the fence uh, as a kind of hunting technique. Um, and, um, you know, so that can also create a, a bit of a problem. So when, you, when you're doing, when you managing uh, animals at that sort of high level, then, then you, you've got to carry on being involved, um, and you've got to be able to um, move animals around in order to maintain some sort of genetic flow. Um, so you then become, you know, take control of that genetic flow, and that, you know, is quite a responsibility. So, uh, I mean, that's pretty much what uh, Vincent over here is, the guy standing on the closest to us, is, is um, doing pretty much full time now. He's got an NGO in, in South Africa, and that's all he does travels around the country with cheetahs in crates, moving them from one place to the other. Um, and I must say that probably as an individual, he's probably more effective than any other cheetah conservationist that I can imagine because he's one person. And in terms of the impact of that one person, I don't know of anybody else who's more uh, effective in expanding the cheetah population anywhere in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, he's really doing quite well under enormous pressure. I certainly wouldn't want his lifestyle. I mean, he just travels all the time. Um, so we, in, in this coal collection, we have four Kalahari reserves. I mean, the typical Kalahari, which is a very arid area, um, high climatic sort of variables, uh, prey density can, you know, they've, they've obviously got small antelope, which is the, the thing that the cheetah loves. Um, but they do have variable density of other competing predators like lions and hyenas and so on. Um, but it is a fairly ideal cheetah ha habitat. 
Um, but then we also have seven thicket reserves. Okay, so this is not the open plains. This is actually dense, dense, but low bush, um, where we've got cheetahs uh, and lions as well. Uh, cheetahs seem to do quite well in that area as well. So it's certainly not a, you know, they don't need the open gra grasslands in order to hunt. They change the hunting style. They seem to become more sort of ambush predators, very similar to leopards. Um, and the, the distances that they chase prey are far shorter than they would in the open grassland. Um, we've got nine Karoo reserves. Here, the, the, I mean, they've got this vast open grassland and um, short scrub. But um, one of the big problems here is potentially that the, during winter it gets extremely cold. We get quite a bit of and snow, but even if there's no snow, uh, it will be very, very cold at night in some of the places like around Sutherland and so on, where you know, get to minus 10, and the cheetahs do fine. Um, there is some interesting dynamic, though. Cheetahs that come from this Karoo area seem to do well, regardless where you send them. But if you take any cheetahs from elsewhere and try and bring them to the Karoo, the, the survival rate plummets. Only about 30 to 40 percent of them survive. So clearly, these Karoo cheetahs are, you know, quite a bit hardier than, um, in, you know, from other areas. We've got actually three floodplain grassland reserves um, as well with, with cheetahs, and um, they, they do all right there as well. And then quite a number of these low felt savanna res reserves where there's actually can be quite dense, um, thicker to woodland. Three typical grassland re reserves that you would get very similar to the sort of Maasai uh, and Serengeti um, plain areas. And then 18 mountainous or savanna reserves, okay, where we've got quite a lot of uh, mountainous areas. They may not necessarily utilize the mountains, but often they will den higher up um, on the hills uh, in, in isolated areas and then um, move down into the plains, you know, to, to hunt the game. Um, and four coastal dune forest reserves. So you can just see that it, it's such a, a mix of habitat uh, and temperature and climatic conditions. Rainfall is... Um, you know, so that this idea that the cheetah is such a specialized grassland species is just um, not true. And the adaptability of the species is actually quite remarkable, um, given the temperature variation and climatic change. But it's quite a job moving these animals all around um, and getting some, uh, you know, as I said, we, we had a number of problems with regards to massive levels of stress and mortalities. But that, uh, I think we're really down to a, a less than a 7% mortality rate now. Um, during translocation and um, hopefully the problem is that we you know there's not one veterinarian doing all of this work I mean it depends one you have a local veterinarian um, doing work up in one area and then down and somebody else down south and so trying to get all of them on board with the same protocol drug protocols um, doing things in the in a similar manner is is quite a job um, so we've been trying to uh, educate them as far as possible but it's 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 taken quite a while this was just that slide to illustrate, yeah, mentioning about the survivability of the crew cheetah um, versus uh, um, bringing cheetahs into the crew and, and having a lower survivability. Um, okay, I'm going to just skip through that slide. Just wanted to show you this. This is, you know, mortality. So I just wanted to say that now I think we've done almost 65 reintroductions of cheetahs. So taking cheetahs into areas where they now or became locally extinct or no longer um, existed. So 65 reintroductions, two of those reintroductions have failed so far. And the main reasons for those reproductive or reintroduction failures um, has been in the one case in Mozambique in Maputo Reserve, um, it was mainly due to a high level of snaring uh, that they were not really aware of, they weren't able to control. So these cheetahs are obviously getting caught in snares um, that are being put out by local people to try and for the for, to capture bush meat. They are obviously not intending to catch cheetahs, but cheetahs uh, often get themselves caught in in those kind of snares, and they end up being fatal. Uh, and then the other res reserve is, is in Zambia that uh, in introduction failed, um, and the, the, probably the main reason there was because the antelope species that the cheetah had available to hunt, which is the lechwe, black lechwe, are actually too big for cheetahs. You know, they're sitting close around 100 kilograms, um, and that might be okay for a male coalition, but it's not you know, it's, it's way too big for a female. Um, to, and there were no smaller antelope in the guild, you know, available for them to, to hunt. So, um, and they, they will always 
they will all lamb or calf, or lechwe, I think they lamb, um, you know, once a year uh, with large numbers of, of offspring, but then the rest of the year there's nothing available uh, for them. So having, um, you know, smaller prey, and if they're not small enough, the adults are not small enough, then having um, offspring available for cheetahs to be able to hunt um, is fairly important. In terms of mortalities during this entire period of time, lions are, are by far the biggest uh, threat to cheetahs, um, responsible for 31% of the actual kills uh, or deaths of these animals, and particularly for cubs. The lions just have a honing um, skill with, with uh, cheetah cubs and will often just destroy um, the cubs. We think it's obviously just a competitive, anti-competitive sort of behavior, so they will um, kill the cubs. Um, anthropogenic uh, reasons, snaring probably being the biggest one, and, and then direct uh, hunting, killing with a rifle. Um, leopards, less of a, of a media threat, sort of 9.1% of the mortalities. Cheetah on cheetah, sometimes males kill females. Um, Sometimes males will kill other males, all right, but very often males killing uh, females. Um, and I think it's mainly just a, an issue of um, fairly inexperienced or aggressive males. Uh, mating between cheetahs is often you know, quite a, an aggressive um, thing. And if the, if the female puts up a lot of resistance, then she can sometimes get herself in trouble as well. So it's a bit of you know, having these inexperienced animals that um, sometimes will go overboard. Um, and then a whole bunch of other fairly unusual things, an ostrich killing yeah, uh, a cheetah before um, even a grey diker causing an accidental death. So we get those from time to time. Um, but the main mortalities or reasons for mortality are, um, are lions. Um, this is just an interesting uh, so uh, interaction between lions, two, two uh, male lions and a cheetah and her cubs. Um, so you'll see the Mother cheetah over there, the cubs are immediately, she knows what's going on here. And the cubs know to head off in the, in the opposite direction, but are not quite certain how to do that. Eventually they do. <laughs> off they go, into the bush. Lions are just stupid, but anyway... Uh, a very clever female. Moves off towards them, makes sure that she's the focus of their attention, the cubs are all safe. And then she knows that she can outrun them. And then they go, go off and, and I'm sure she'll be fine because she'll definitely be able to outrun them. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. So with a, with a, a very experienced um, female, I mean, we have it in Pinda, which is probably our most uh, successful reserve in terms of producing cheetah as that have gone out of Pinda. Pinda is in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Um, they have lions, high lion density. They have a, a fair number of leopards, and they certainly have a large number of spotted hyenas. But Pinda has produced more than 80 cheetahs that have been exported from that reserve um, since the uh, metapopulation project started. Um, so it really clearly shows that, you, I mean, even with a high, a high lion density, if you've got very uh, savvy animals, um, ch cheetah mothers, then they can actually still. And I've seen personally, be, I've seen in, in Pinda, I've been uh, there and seen a mother with four adult cubs that were about to disperse. You know, so um, that's quite remarkable in you know considering that they have such a high lion uh, density in that reserve. Um, sometimes the interaction with with leopards. Um, this, this is a young male leopard um, approaching. I think there were two female, uh, two. Uh, immediately, what a leopard does in the, you know, when it's you turn onto its back, and you've got two male cheetahs. You don't want to attack a leopard when it's lying down like that. It's got all the sharp ends up. So very often, the adult um, cheetahs can cope with leopards. They're not really a major threat to them, especially a male coalition. I mean, will will handle a leopard very well. But again, the problem 
is, is on cub survival, um, which is, is more of a, a big problem. I mean, they, I think they eventually chased the leopard up a tree. In this, just, oh, there's still a little bit left, yeah. But we actually have seen leopard actually attack cheetah and then actually even eat them. Um, so. I ended it over there. Okay, now I think uh, this leopard eventually got chased up a tree by those two. And I've seen actual cheetahs also steal the prey from a leopard. But then again, you're going to have at least you know two or three males together to be able to do that. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Uh, I think that's the, the one. Okay, so quite a, a sometimes an aggressive interaction between them, and um, it can be a real problem. And this, okay, I'm not, uh, this is a, a, a cub being chased by a leopard, young leopard again. And it's, it's over in seconds. And the mother comes to chase the leopard away, but just one bite to the back of their neck, and the neck is broken, and um, yeah. So that's unfortunately the reality of this. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that one. Spotted hyenas, also a big problem. I mean, occasionally killing adult uh, cheetahs, but um, again, a very big problem with regards to cubs. So they really do, I mean, they have to compete against these other carnivores, but still manage to do so successfully in certain areas. Yeah, yeah you can see the cheetahs chasing away the chasing, chasing hyenas, so sometimes they do get the upper hand. Um, so this was just showing that if you don't have, uh, this was uh, from Mountain Zebra National Park, uh, where they introduced a couple of uh, cheetahs, I think there were two or three, and in the end, they bred more than, within a, in three or four years, they bred more than 30 um, offspring. Okay, and that was a reserve where there were no lions involved. Um, it's, you know, down in the Karoo, and there's, um, at that stage, they must have had a fairly low leopard density. And um, these cheetahs then multiply, they really do very, very well. Um, now they've introduced lions into Mountain Zebra Reserve. Okay, and so there's a little bit of a higher mortality rate and control um, of the, the cheetah population in the reserve. Um, this was that Malawi introduction, again, a fairly uh, successful um, introduction. The Zambian introduction, I mean, it's been some, somewhat successful in some areas, and others, as I said, not so successful where we've had uh, these lechware that were the only species that are available. Um, and where we've, you know, this is, you know, you can see the lechware over there. I mean, you can see the size of that, um, you know, that's quite a big antelope size, and for the smaller females, it, it's not really going to be um, that successful. Okay, I just want to... Why, which, no. Mozambique, um, we introduced uh, cheetahs into um, a northern area of Mozambique, which was far more successful than around Maputo, where we, where I told you about the snaring problem. Up there, it's quite a, a vast sort of grass wetland area. And um, one of the problems there, I mean, it's very similar to India, where we, we don't have any fences in the reserve. And um, so it was quite interesting then releasing the cheetahs into that, that area. They had five or six I think there were three males and about four, yeah, three, three or four females, um, um, sorry, three males and two or three females. And the um, problem was that the males just, two of the males just started heading off in one direction, walked off towards Byra, 200 kilometers away. And we don't really know what the reason is, I mean, because there was a good prey base in the, in the area that we uh, introduced them. Um, so no reason to just keep walking off in a direction, but I think that some of these males just start walking when they, they're looking for other, other cheetahs and uh, either for some reason not happy with the ones that we you know, dropped off with them and they're looking for new friends, but they kept walking and walking and walking and um, actually not hunting very much at all. And by the time that, okay, I, we were not in, when they were found, um, when they turned back, uh, you know, when they counted the actual residential boundary in, in Byra and turned back, um, one had already uh, he died of starvation. Okay, and so the lesson learned from that one was that uh, very soon we would rather go and fetch those cheetahs. So if they start walking off in a direction that far away, we would actually immobilize them, dart them from a helicopter, and bring them back again. Some of them we've had to do that twice, 
Uh, and then they suddenly decide, okay, well, that's fine, they'll, they'll hang around. <laughs> So, but we're not going to allow them to ever get to that stage where they actually starve, you know, like that before. And, and that, that post-release monitoring is such a crucial part of what we need to do to make sure that they are feeding, that they're not just, um, you know, migrating off in a direction. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to check that this was the right presentation that I loaded up there. Okay, in terms of the Indian um, reintroduction, um, so there's a lot of a background story to this, but basically the last physical evidence of a cheetah in India was in 1948, which was declared ex extinct there. Um, before that, they had occurred in their thousands. There's one actual, uh, um, I'm not sure what they're called, but the nobility of India, um, one guy who apparently at one stage had a thousand captive cheetahs. They used to use them um, as you know, for hunting, for hunting of game species. They would carry the cheetah on the back of a cart with a blindfold on, and um, they, these animals were, were tamed. Um, and then when they saw an Indian blackbuck or, or um, spotted deer or whatever, they would take the blindfold off. The cheetah would be off the back of, of the of the cart, would chase down the the antelope, catch the antelope. Um, and you know that's how they used them for, for hunting. Uh, now I don't know what a you know a thousand cheetahs in a captive uh, collection looks like, um, but uh, and whether that was true. But they certainly were very very large collections at one stage. After colonialism, um, you know quite a lot of those cheetahs were hunted. I mean the British I think brought in a very different culture uh, of um, of hunting, and we had the same experience in in South Africa where. We had vast, vast herds of millions of springbuck that migrated across South Africa and many other species, black wildebeest, um, blessbuck, etc. These, these grassland species, that, that these mass migrations in very similar to the wildebeest migration in, in the Masai Mara and Kenya, um, in Tanzania and Kenya. The, but it's exactly the same sort of migration that happened in southern Africa. And when the British arrived there, the, well, I'm not saying it's just the British, but maybe some of the uh, Afrikaners themselves too, just shot these herds to depletion. And very same sort of situation in India, and often these cheetahs were considered as vermin, and they paid very low reward prices, you know, but you, you know, for a dead cheetah you would get quite a, a, a substantial reward. Well, for the locals it was a substantial reward. What they did with them I don't really know. Um, but yeah, uh, the last ones disappeared. A lot of being controversy, so they wanted to get these cheetahs reintroduced. Um, there was an initial attempt to try and get some of the uh, Asiatic cheetahs, the, or the ones from Iran, but that population by then had already um, decreased quite substantially, and there was then a war going on, and uh, yeah, basically that, that didn't, didn't happen. Um, then they, uh, you know, West African cheetah was possibly also a possibility, but looking at their numbers, I mean, that was also not going to be really an, an issue or a, a viable option. And then um, in 2013, they uh, we wanted to introduce the Southern African cheetah. Ended up in a court case in 2020 where, uh, I mean, initially the, the Supreme Court of India basically said, no, you can't bring the cheetahs um, to India. And then that was appealed and they, they won the appeal in 2020. Um, based on, on some of the arguments. There was also a big meeting in India with all of the cheetah experts around the world that came together to discuss the reintroduction and the agreement at the end of it was that it's worthwhile actually you know, trying to see um, whether it can be done or not. Um, so um, this year finally it, it has gone ahead, or at least the first phase of the Namibian cheetahs has gone ahead, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, so in terms of subspecies now, I mean, this is the whole debate as to, you know, what is a subspecies and do we try and conserve subspecies separately? Uh, do we try and look at them as one species? I mean, sometimes it does get a little bit ridiculous uh, because even, you know, that divide between the sort of East African, the ones in Kenya and Tanzania and the ones in Ethiopia and further north into Somaliland, I mean, there's no geographical divide there. Um, and yet, if there's slight genetic variation, then people want to jump on that and say, well, this is now you know, a different subspecies and that we now to conserve it. Well, I can tell you now that in Iran, if you're going to conserve the Iranian um, subspecies of cheetah as a single unit, you're already doomed. You might as well just go and shoot all of the rest of those animals now. They're not really, it's the same with the northern white rhino. We're down to three individuals now, all female. The last male, I think, is dead. Um, and, you know, the point of now trying to do fancy, uh, you know, embryo transfers and all that sort of time to, to restrict those three animals, I think, is insane. 
And I think this is the case where I, I really believe in hybridization. Just put the white southern African white rhinos in there, get them to breed with these northern white rhinos. Uh, I don't even know if those females will be able to breed anymore. They're, they're you know, getting quite old. But if they could, that's what I would have done a lot earlier. Now you've still got the genes. The genes are still in the population. They haven't gone anywhere. They just, you've just done, an, you know, hybridization is a normal process that happens. Plants, we don't seem to bother with it at all. We've, you know, uh, when plants are hybridized, but we seem to be very, very concerned about it happening in, uh, in antelope species uh, in South Africa. If, you, if they find a blessback um, uh, hot to be a hybrid, they go and shoot it. You know, um, so it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's very strange the way they, you know, have these different standards for different things. That for me is a, is a uh, an issue. But now you, you, there's no way. Even the North Africa, the West African uh, cheetah. I mean, it's got virtually no chance of survival unless things change dramatically very, very soon for those species. And you're already then starting from this very small, isolated population. Whereas if we treat them as one global species and um, conserve them in that way. Um, stop worrying about minor and coat color or you know variation in their genetics. Then you know I think you, could, you stand a chance to actually do something and do something successfully. Um, anyway, some challenges in in India uh, with regards to some of the other species there. Obviously, got tigers. Now tigers are mostly um, in the forested areas towards the east, the east and south. Uh, there are a few tiger reserves around. Um, uh, Madhya Pradesh uh, area, but the wetter areas, they don't really like the open grasslands. Uh, you've got jackals, you've got uh, the Indian wolf, you've got the leopard, which is actually uh, distributed through most of the country. And then you have uh, you know, some bears as well. Um, all of these potentially could be a threat, not uh, the tigers to adult cheetahs, the leopard possibly to adult cheetahs, but they're far more of a threat again to the cheetah cubs. But Cheetahs would have existed there at some stage in areas where you would have had all of these species together in, a, in the same area. Um, so this is quite small, sorry. But the two main areas, uh, obviously, is you know, the west and northern, northern side of the country where, uh, you know, bordering on Pakistan, so Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh uh, are the main sites, Madhya Pradesh being the main uh, initial site where, we're going to, where we've done the introduction now. Um, but then there are also a few sites in Rajasthan as well. And this is an um, ecosystem where we have much more open grasslands. It's a lot drier. Um, they still experience monsoon you know, rains, uh, you know, sort of between June and um, the end of August, uh, sometimes a little bit into September. But then it's dry the rest of the year. What I really wanted to show you here is just this is a, um, a place in Rajasthan where um, you have potential cheetah habitat. Uh, there are a number of other species here that are critically endangered, the Indian blackbuck. There are quite a number of busted uh, species, uh, ground-dwelling birds, the Indian busted uh, probably being one of the main ones, um, that would have occurred in this area now and that are now critically endangered. One of the big problems here in this area is just the fact that cattle are everywhere in India. They have the highest uh, density of cattle anywhere in the world. And as you would know, I mean, they have a bit of an uh, issue with, with utilizing the cattle. So they, they obviously have um, cows for milk, uh, but the bulls um, have very little value uh, because they can't be utilized, you know, because of religious re reasons for their meat. So these bulls become quite feral and they wander all over the place. Um, and, you know, just if you drive anywhere in rural India, I mean, it's just cattle everywhere. And sometimes, I mean, I had to try and move them out of the road at night because they're lying on the road and you can't get past. Um, and they won't move even if you drive the car right up to them. But one of the problems is, so even these are protected areas in, um, in India. The local conservation authorities here have no real strong incentive to actually remove the cattle from the parks because they're going to come into conflict with the locals who are quite keen to have their cattle graze in, into conservation areas. Um, and the grazing is... Over, I mean, these areas are horribly overgrazed. There's massive areas of erosion um, because these monsoons dump a lot of water on that place in a short space of time. So this grassland is decimated. There are no prey uh, species that are able to survive here um, you know, for very long, only probably around the time of the monsoon when this does transform into quite a bit of a grassland, but it's already a damaged grassland. And, of course, this has an impact on all the other grassland species. So the main aim here with, with this project is to try and provide, like the tigers have, I mean, if you go to any of the tiger reserves in India, you'll see unbelievable biodiversity. 
Uh, and the main reason why you see that biodiversity, I mean, Ashley and I were trying to stop to do birding, you know, along the way, and it was quite frustrating because the guy that was, you know, the guide, he was, he thought we were just there to see tigers. Um, so every time we would stop him, he'd say, no, but the tigers, but the tigers. No, don't worry about the tigers. We, you know, we've seen enough tigers in our life. We'll get to them. But the birds, amazing birds. But the reason why you have that biodiversity is because people are kept out of the, the conservation areas, um, obviously because tigers are a threat to, to, to people. And the cattle get eaten by the tigers, so there are very few cattle, and people will keep the cattle out of those reserved areas. Um, so that has an immediate knock-on effect. Now, the problem is, yeah, tigers, this is too dry for tigers. They're not going to survive here uh, at all. Um, leopards will still um, survive in this, in this area, but leopards have such a, I mean, low value in terms of people wanting to see them. Even the conservation staff don't really even care that they're there. Um, so interestingly enough, the cheetah being a charismatic species, it's not a threat to humans. Um, you know, very few cheetah attacks on, on humans, or even on children. Um, and the possibility of bringing a cheetah as a keystone species into an area like this would change everything with regards to the conservation. Uh, uh, cattle, first of all, would need, need, need to be kept out of these reserves if they want the cheetah to survive, because the prey species like the Indian blackbuck, the uh, four-horned antelope, the, uh, and the mainly the spotted deer, the, ch the uh, chital, and even the chinkara, uh, those are species that would only survive if there was sufficient grassland for them to, to, to graze on. So. Um, that sort of knock-on effect that you'd have. They have, you mean, see, this is a wall over here. It's a, um, this, these stone walls are, you know, I mean, found throughout India, um, and they're mainly there to control cattle, keep cattle out of uh, their pastures, um, the rice paddies, and so, so on. Um, but around many of the reserves, they have these um, stone walls. But you can see this is broken down completely. Nobody repairs it because they don't really care for the cattle going in and out. So as soon as you start repairing this wall, keeping the cattle out. Um, you're going to have a massive effect on the biodiversity. And that's one of the main reasons why we would want to really in reintroduce uh, cheetahs into there. Because we don't really necessarily need another big carnival to hunt the local uh, antelope species. Um, uh, you know, because the leopard does that pretty well. I mean, Kuno National Park, where we've now just put the, the cheetahs there, has one of the highest leopard densities in the world. 27 leopards per 100 square kilometers. Okay, so that's higher than anywhere in South Africa that I'm aware of. Um, and so they hammer the, 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 the spotted deer pretty effectively, at least at night. We think now during the day the cheetah is going to start hunting uh, them as well, so it's going to change their behavior. Um, but but uh, with the in, in increased conservation efforts, um, you know, the, the other thing is that um, these deer drop two lambs usually a year. Um, at, and it's not it's in, it's not a specific any any specific season, and that would be perfect for cheetahs, you know, to to have that prey available, the additional small prey available. All right, so this was part of the first um, where Namibia uh, gave eight uh, cheetahs to um, India, and hopefully in about a month's time we will be taking another 12 from South Africa. Um, so these cheetahs were. Uh, I mean, although they're wild, they, uh, Dr. Laurie Marco, who's uh, at CCF, they, they have a very different way of working with them. They, they will put them in a fairly small boma um, for, a, for a while, and they habituate their, them to that, and, and the crate is placed at the end of that boma. Um, so the animals, whenever there is sort of any sort of fearful event, they kind of run into the crate, and they, they kind of feel the crate is a kind of refuge for them. So when the time comes for us to sort of load them, she can kind of just push them into the crates without any uh, um, anesthesia or anything like that. Fortunately, we persuaded her to give a long-acting tranquilizer. So these animals all had uh, were then hand-injected um, with uh, perfenacine, and that really worked very, very nicely. They, they slept um, very, very well. And then transported a four and a half hour drive from uh, area up north in Ochavarongo down to Vintuk to the uh, international airport. Um, four crates in each uh, truck and with a nice big uh, convoy. And then, <laughs> I don't know why they managed to go for a 747. Uh, <laughs> it was actually a Russian plane that had been painted with a Amur Tiger uh, quite a long time ago. Um, but uh, a Russian uh, hired uh, 747 um, at Vintuk Airport, which we transferred them from the actual trucks onto the airplane. Um, and then moved them, well then it was an 11-hour flight over to uh, Gwalior Airport, which is, well actually it's an Air Force base, 
and uh, India's biggest Air Force base. Um, and then from there, transferred them into these MI-17 helicopters, these military helicopters. There's a bit of a concern with these helicopters because they make an incredible noise. Initially, they wanted to take them with a Chinook, uh, which is a much bigger helicopter, and they would put all eight cheetahs and all uh, the people going with, uh, all the, um, the staff going with uh, in that big one. But it, you know, noise in that helicopter is absolutely um, unbearable. It's 110 decibels, you know, for a 30-minute flight, and that we decided was going to be way too much for the animals. So these are still very loud, 85 decibels, but they were um, the actual cheetahs did still very, very, very well. Only problem was on the other side, it was very hot, over 30 degrees and very, very humid, and we had over a thousand people there um, because the Prime Minister of India was there to open up the first crate, big ceremony, and we had to offload the cheetahs, um, try and put them in the shade, try and keep the crowds away from them, um, and wait for this whole process to go, <laughs> you know, while before we could actually release them into the um, quarantine bombers. But fortunately, the drugs worked quite well. And there was a bit of a wind blowing, so that we, we, we did get to, you know, were able to keep them relatively cool in the shade until all the formalities were over, and then we could release them into these are the initial quarantine bombers. So, right in the middle of the park, they've built a quarantine facility um, with these electrified fences to keep uh, any leopards out, and to, you know, they've got to be there for 30 days in these small bombers where they're going to be fed some, some buffalo meat, and um, uh, they've got a few other types of meat available. And then from there, once they've finished the 30 days, they, which will be in about three weeks' time, they will be released into, uh, this is one of the cheetahs, this is one of the females. Um, uh, she was actually quite interesting in that she didn't want to eat. She was the only one that didn't really want to eat uh, when we offloaded her. All the others ate. Um, and then they were getting a bit worried about her not eating, and eventually they decided, well, because they were trying just buy buffalo meat. You can't use cow meat, obviously. Uh, or beef, um, so they were using uh, buffalo. Uh, all the others ate, but then sh they decided, well, they're going to put a chicken, live chicken, in with her and a live rabbit. And of course, she took those out very, very quickly, ate them both, and then they gave her 15 kilograms of goat meat, which she then ate in one sitting. So clearly, no problem. She just doesn't particularly like the buffalo. So, um, but once they finish there, then they get released out into um, uh, it's a five square kilometer uh, camp. Um, that's broken up into eight different subsections. So most of the ca internal camps are around about um, one uh, well, ha half a square kilometer. Um, so fairly, fairly large bombers, but in here they already have got uh, spotted deer. Um, that in one of the sections when they'll probably be driving spotted deer into those bombers and they'll be, you know, start hunting spotted deer inside the inside the bombers. Um, and one of the issues there is just, you know, to kill an animal, to feed to another animal in India is quite a challenge. You know, it's much, they're quite happy for you to chase live prey into the, into the bowman and have the cheetahs kill them themselves because then they're not responsible, you know, for the, for the killing. So it is a little bit of a challenge. But on the other hand, the, that attitude towards not killing animals is a massive, massive advantage. You know, when we're going to release these animals, they don't, most fences, I mean, most reserves across India do not have any fences. They're all open systems. Those animals can move in any direction, go anywhere they want to. What they do there is they manage the interaction uh, between, I mean, uh, 1.3 billion people, and they manage their wildlife and their interaction with wildlife very effectively. If a cheetah or a lion or a tiger kills um, anyone's livestock, those people get immediately compensated for the, for the, for the loss. Um, so the a general attitude is very positive towards these animals, and they treat it a bit like celebrities. They, the, certainly the cheetahs are. Not so sure about all the tigers. But um, if you had to kill a tiger in India, I mean, first of all, they've got about 700 or so individuals, of which 95% of them uh, they've got DNA samples from. They've got coat pattern uh, recognition software. So if you had to poach a, a tiger any, anywhere in India, you, you know, you're gonna, and you get caught with that skin, they'll know exactly where it came from, and you, the, you know, the penalties are really harsh. So the general attitude, besides the sort of religious approach to, to wildlife, um, the, the, the law enforcement is pretty good. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't have any possibility of snares. Uh, there are still some groups within India, small um, uh, tribes, uh, you know, groups of people that, that still do some, uh, that live off the land and do, do some poaching, but um, they certainly are very much in the minority at the moment. But yeah, what will happen when we release them out of these, this, five square kilometer bomber out um, and you know which is the plan 
then um, we, we need, re really need to be able to, first of all, there are no helicopters in, in India that are used for game capture or anything like that, like we have in South Africa. Um, so, uh, you know, these animals are going to have to be approachable. We must be able to get within range and they must recognize certain vehicles. We don't have to recognize, you know, come to every single vehicle, but we will, we're habituating them to specific vehicles. And then we also uh, will habituate them to elephants so that we can approach them on elephant back um, to be able to dart them should we need to if they become injured or if they stray too far away. I mean, an isolated cheetah on its own somewhere in the middle of nowhere is of no use to anyone because it's never going to have an opportunity to breed with anything. So we have to try and keep them together as a group and, um, you know, uh, for, for in, at least the initial period until we have an established population. Now, there also are, besides this initial reserve, uh, there are other potential reserves uh, in, in Rajasthan. Um, there's actually one very nice one that's got a, a, a you know, it's a, 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 um, 800 hectare, I think it's about 800 hectare. Sorry, 8,000 hectares, which has got a fence all the way around it, um, and that would be, and it's open plain, um, beautiful grassland, which would be an ideal spot to to release them. And there, they have very low leopard density and no tigers, um, so uh, as, as well. So that will be, you know, uh, now there's a lot of negotiation going on to make sure that we get that reserve as well. But there are probably 50 or 60 reserves across that central and northern uh, western area of, of India that would be suitable you know, for cheetah at some stage. So that then seems like a massive range expansion and, and I'm sure that if this turns out to be successful there'll be other countries that will also in the Middle East and so on that will be looking to reintroduce cheetahs into their reserves. So. Lots of risks still because the leopard density in there, we don't know what's going to happen when we release them out and how they're going to interact with those leopards. Um, is it you know, going to be a major problem, especially if they're going to have cubs? Um, how are they going to protect those cubs? The grass there at the moment, I mean, some areas you couldn't move through the grass. The grass the end of the monsoon now, it's standing this high. There's no way that even a cheetah is going to move through there. But there are other areas where um, you've got a canopy of, of trees and it's open underneath the canopy and you can see that the, the deer like grazing that area because they've got good vis visibility, but I think the cheetah are going to do perfectly well in that environment as well. So again, because of the, we know that they're really adaptable in southern Africa to different environments, different levels of, of, of cover, different climatic conditions, um, you know, we're pretty sure that they're going to, going to thrive. So, any questions on that? I don't know if they were, I mean, if you, in terms of cheetah conservation and how people can, um, you know, I, I think in, in South Africa, it's, um, I, I try and encourage anybody, I don't care what they do, whether they're going to be doing rewilding, whether they're doing captive breeding, whether they're doing, you know, if they're involved somehow, I think it's of value um, overall to the species. I don't like the, this idea that we, you know, people point fingers and say, well, this is the way to do it and you shouldn't be doing it like that. We long past that kind of um, luxury of uh, criticizing people for the way in which they're doing things. People that are trying um, new ideas, I think that's absolutely, the, the world is changing way too fast. Uh, climate change is just beyond our own control. And if we, can, if we think we can sit back and just, um, you know, have these pristine environments where we can let nature take its own course without any sort of intervention, uh, I think those days are long gone. There are very few areas in the world where that is, that is actually going to be um, of any great use, even in the, you know, um, up in the Arctic. I mean, at the moment, I heard um, that we're having major problems with with some of the walruses and seals um, there that now no longer have any pack ice um, to to lie on. So they're lying on these mud flats. The colour of the mud is like dark in colour. So they're getting covered in this dark mud. Temperature, their body temperature is going up, and they're actually getting mortalities from from overheating. Um, you know, so in that sort of situation, I mean, there's very, you know, nobody's out there shooting seals or doing anything to those animals. Nobody's controlling them. But, but if you leave it to its, its, uh, to just continue like that um, without trying some sort of intervention, then you might as well write off that entire species. You know, it's the end of them. You know, so some things like this transcontinental relocation of one subspecies into an, another area is certainly something that I think we're going to see more and more of. They already have introduced bison into parts of England, where I mean European bison, uh, and those animals never existed in England before. Certainly not the European bison. 
um, but for a specific ecological reason, to open up woodland and to, to in, you know, cause some habitat transformation, uh, which would then benefit other species. So again, I think we have we don't have a complete knowledge of how the imp how these species will impact other things, but we have the ability to be able to learn and and, and um, learn from these introductions to be able to then you know do things differently next time, change the adaptive management as we go along, and I think those are the things kind of things that we really need to um, stop being so uh, old-fashioned about you know with regards to conservation. Certainly not any time to, to try and keep these little pockets of small numbers of animals separate from each other. Uh, okay, but that's my opinion. <laughs>